Good afternoon and thank you very much for tuning in. Today we'll be looking at membrane transport. So the cell membrane is referred to as semi-permeable. It has both hydrophobic and hydrophilic properties. So hydrophobic means that it loves water and hydrophilic means that it loves water. And it's also amphiphatic, meaning that it has it loves both. So if it's amphipathic, it, it loves both. The cell membrane has the ability to allow small polar molecules and non-polar molecules to pass through, such as oxygen and carbon dioxide, via a process known as diffusion, in which this is from an area of high concentration to an area of low concentration. Water can pass through the, through the membrane via osmosis. So to give an example of the permeability of the membrane, as you can see in this diagram here, high permeability gases such as carbon dioxide, nitrogen, oxygen, and very small uncharged molecules such as ethanol can easily penetrate the membrane and go through. As you go down the list, moderate, there is water, low, there's polar organic molecules such as sugars, and very low permeability to pass through the membrane is ions and charged polar molecules and macromolecules such as amino acids, ATP, proteins, polysaccharides, nucleic acids, and the ions such as sodium, potassium, magnesium, calcium, and chlorine. A couple of terms you would need to know regarding regarding membrane transport is diffusion, osmosis, passive transport, and active transport. Diffusion is the movement of molecules from an area of high water concentration to an area of low concentration. Osmosis is the movement of water from an area of high concentration to an area of low concentration across a semi-permeable membrane. Passive transport is the movement of a molecule into the cell without the use of energy. And active transport is the movement of a molecule into or out of the cell which requires energy. As defined previously, osmosis is a movement of water from a high concentration to a low, low concentration and cells will take on water by osmosis to compensate for changes in water concentration very easily. This in turn affects the shape of the cell. So as you can see by a diagram here, if it's a hypertonic solution, Look at how the cells look there compared to an isotonic and compared to a hypotonic. In the next slide, we will discuss the names of these different types of shapes. So, looking at the effect of osmosis on cells in hypotonic solutions, which involves low water concentration to high solute concentrations, the shape is plasmolysis. And if you can see on the left hand side here at the bottom of the diagram, the hypotonic, hypertonic solution, it is plasmalized. In an isotonic solution where there is balanced water concentration and balanced solute concentration, the shape is referred to as flaccid. And in hypotonic solutions with high water concentration and low solute concentration, the shape is referred to as turgid. Passive transport. So diffusion and osmosis refers to pass passive transports in which that no energy is required. Some molecules are too large to pass through unaided without any help or must be able to move large quantities of molecules through a gradient. For these, integral proteins are created which create a pore in the membrane and allow for facilitated diffusion across the membrane. So let's have an example of facilitated diffusion. This involves aquaporins. So these allow for the free movement of large volumes of water across the cell membrane and kidneys. Aquaporin 2 needs to be activated by ADH to allow for the pore to open, but this does not require any energy. With regards to active transport, this, is, this requires the presence of energy in the form of adenosine triphosphate. Active transport can be used to move molecules across a diffusion gradient. So one of the most important mechanisms you would have to know as a biology student, biomedical student, biochemistry student is a sodium potassium pump. So sodium ions in the cytosol of the cell bind to the pump which is an integral membrane protein. When there are free sodium ions bound, the pump is stimulated by ATPase phosphorylation. The pump then undergoes a conformational change releasing the sodium ions to the extracellular space. The change conformation then exposes two sites for potassium binding from the extracellular space. When potassium is bound to these sites, the phosphate is released from the pump. The conformation of the pump changes and the potassium ion is released into the cytosol. So here's a diagram to explain that. So as you see in step one, the protein in the membrane, integral membrane protein, binds intracellular sodium. In step two, ATP phosphorylates the protein with bound sodium. And then in step three, 
Phosphorylation causes conformational change in the protein, allowing sodium to leave. So look at this side. From the intercellular side, three sodium ions are going in, and the shape is normal, then it's bound, but then the shape changes once the ATP phosphorylates the protein, and the protein is released onto the extracellular side. However, now that the sodium has been released to the extracellular site, the extracellular potassium comes into that same conform conform uh, conformation and binds to the exposed sites. Binding of the potassium causes dephosphorylation of the protein, and this dephosphorylation triggers the change back to the original conformation where potassium moves into the cell and the cycle repeats. So you have three sodium ions going in, binding to the membrane prote protein, changing the shape once ATP phosphorylation activates it. They release on from the intercellular to the extracellular side. The extracellular potassium then comes and binds to that same conformation. Then dephosphorylation occurs and the potassium is released to the intercellular side. So intracellular sodium moves to the extracellular site, side, and extracellular potassium moves to the intercellular side. And it's always in the ratio free sodium to two potassium. So let's have a look at active transport quota. Pro-transportation. So this occurs where there is a primary and secondary integrin which is driven by the primary protein. Sodium glucose co-transportation requires a sodium gradient to be set up where there is an excess of extracellular sodium. This gradient then drives the transportation of glucose from the extracellular matrix to the cytosol. With regards to electrogenic pumps, electrogenic pumps move ions across the membrane to create an electrical gradient between the cell and its environment. There are many types of electrogenic pump, but we can see this clearly in proton pumps. Proton pumps bind a molecule of hydrogen ions, which causes a change in the protein. This allows for adenosine triphosphate to bind, and once bound, the ATP phosphorylates to produce adenosine diphosphate and releases a hydrogen proton across the membrane. So as described in the previous slide, you can see here, the hydrogen ions are moving from the intercellular to the extracellular. We had the ATP and the hydrogen pump hydrogen ion being bounded to the pump, bounded to the pump, and then this moves it from intercellular to extracellular. The final part I want to look at is endocytosis. So endocytosis is a type of active transport that moves large particles or volumes of liquid into a cell. Various forms of endocytosis exist, but they have very similar characteristics. The plasma membrane invaginates around the particle, and this section is then cut off, forming a vesicle within the cell. There are three types of endocytosis. There's the septum mediated endocytosis, phagocytosis, and pinocytosis. With regards to the septum mediated endocytosis, targeted uptake, or targeted uptake of specific molecules such as low density lipoprotein and iron into the cell. This molecule binds to the specific receptor on the cell membrane, triggering a conformational change in the second message, secondary messages in the cell. They then start to recruit clathrin. Receptor-bound ligand then moves along the membrane to the clathrin-coated pit. When it reaches the pit, it is folded inwards and the membrane is then cut from the membrane and fuses with the endosome and the cytoplasm. The clathrin is then removed from the endosome and the ligand and the receptor protein separated. The ligand is broken down and used by the cell and the receptor is recycled. So here's a diagram for everyone that wants to go into detail about the septum mediated endocytosis. So the ligand binds the receptor, the receptor ligand moves to a clathrin coated pit, the membrane folds inwards, the vesicles enter, the, the loss of the clathrin coat, the receptor and ligands separate, the ligands go to the lysosomes or Golgi apparatus for processing, the receptors move to the membrane and then the vesicle fuses the membrane and endocytosis occurs. With regards to phagocytosis and pinocytosis, so phagocytosis is referred to as cell eating and this is used to engulf large insoluble particles. This occurs in many cell types but only professional phagocytes such as immune cells do it efficiently. Pinocytosis is referred to as cell drinking and this is used to engulf quantities of liquid from the extracellular matrix containing solutes. In both cases, the importation into the cell creates an intracellular vesicle of a spherical phospholipid bilayer. 